Derek and Beverly Joubert have spent more time filming and living among lions in the wild than anyone alive today. The discoveries they've made over 30 years of filmmaking have challenged conventional wisdom about Africa's big cats. They've made more than 20 films for National Geographic, where they are explorers in residence. They live in Botswana, in the heart of southern Africa, a country about the size of Texas. The Jubers often go long stretches without seeing another human being. But they made an exception for us and allowed us to join them in a wild place they call home. Their films are known for these spectacular cinematic moments. But what distinguishes their work is their belief that all the animals have untold stories, which they bring to life in their films. To get to the Joubert's, we flew to this remote landing strip, but we couldn't land until these wild baboons were cleared from the runway. There she is. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. How are you? <laughs> It didn't take us long to discover why they decided to make Botswana's Okavango Delta their home. This is one of the last untouched places on Earth. A labyrinth of watery channels and rolling savannas that are home to some of Africa's most beautiful creatures. But it was the lions that drew the Jubeirs here, and for most of their lives they've lived among these animals, making some of the greatest wildlife films ever made. We spent thousands and thousands of hours with them. We spent more hours with lions than we've done at university, school, with either of our parents. So, so this is our family in many ways. Derek does the filming and writes the scripts for their movies. Beverly records sound and takes pictures. She's a world-class photographer. Each film takes years to make. They followed this lioness they call Madi Tao for seven years, and they made a movie about her called The Last Lions. Today, Madi Tao, mother of lions, earns her name as protector of her young. The film told the moving story of her battle to survive alone with her three cubs. One thing that we have learned, and it's been a hard lesson, is that we can never predict what is going to happen. First of all, a cub was taken by a crocodile. And then later on, sadly, another one was injured. Stampeding buffalo had badly wounded the cub. Just as any mother would, you see Madi Tao go over to it. She tries to take it with her but there's nothing she can do. And her survival instincts take over. When we filmed it, I sort of said to Beverly, let's just cover this, because we'll never use this. This is too, too sad and too... Uh, too traumatic too at traumatic, the time. Yeah. I mean, it's too traumatic for us to even uh, witness it. Tell me about that moment. It broke our hearts in so many ways, because we knew that it was hopeless. I mean, a little cub dragging its body, a broken back. What, what could she do? She was struggling with what we can only assume as emotions and coming to terms with it because after that she blinks, she, she swallows, she looks around and then she steps away from her cub for the last time. Derek and Beverly took us deep into the delta to see the lions. First we had to cross this bridge which you can't see because it's mostly underwater. Think of crossing this at four in the morning in well, winter time, and it's pitch dark. The channel is full of crocodiles. And it's about four meters deep here, so it's, uh, if we tipped in now, we would lose the vehicle. And how uh, safe is this bridge? No, it's not too good, hey? Water has claimed three of their trucks already, and out here, their vehicle is everything. It's where they work and often sleep, staking out the animals for months at a time, waiting for those rare moments that make their films so memorable. They have no doors and no protection. We've been charged by lions a lot, but they've never scratched us. What is it like to be charged by a lion? 
And it's fairly dramatic, you know. Um, we've had some where they come out of nowhere and it's roaring and, and fiery eyes and right in your face and, and flared up manes and kicking dust all over you. Very dramatic. They told us they never want to influence the lion's natural behavior, so they usually try to keep their distance. But as we found, you never really know what's going to happen. She's coming to us for shade. Yep, she's lying in our shade. As Derek leaned down to get a closer shot. Can somebody hang on to my belt? His camera was staring straight into the young lion's face. That's rare. We almost never get this top angle. It takes you years, huh, to make these movies. It takes us forever. And it's slowly piecing together good scenes and good opportunities like this. Unusual angles. And just getting to know the lions well. And understanding what they do. They've been searching for stories in the African bush since they were in their 20s. Early on, they decided to concentrate on documenting lions at night. For the next 15 years, they worked in the dark. And what they documented changed what we know about these wild animals. The night opened up a veil of what was happening, and nobody had ever seen it in Africa before. They filmed these bloody nighttime battles between lions and hyenas, images that inspired the producers of The Lion King and shattered the myth that hyenas were just scavengers. And we were finding exactly the opposite. A lot of the time, hyenas were making the kills. The lions were rushing in and scavenging from, from the hyenas. In the middle of another hot summer night, they documented something else that surprised the scientific world. All of a sudden, I saw eight lions just move forward. It was a spectacular scene. A pride of lions attacked this fully grown elephant. We'd never seen an elephant this size being attacked by lions. Halfway through this sort of elation of, of us blurry eyed saying, we're capturing something amazing here. Um, I heard her start to say, come get on, up. get up now, get up now. So she started to root for the elephant. Yeah, the, the compassion um, towards that elephant. Uh, you know, I was filled with it. And I was just rooting for her. I say that death begins in the eyes. And we've seen this so many times with animals where they, they give up hope. And all of a sudden, you saw her swing her body and she rocked and rocked. And she fought for her life. She truly did. She pulled herself Something up. And forces through it, goes through that wall and survives. And, and then she charged off into the darkness. They still film at night when they need to, but most of the time they work long days that begin before dawn. Their refuge is their home, this tent sitting in the middle of nowhere, looking out over the delta. It's what they call their paradise. It doesn't get better than this. No, you're right. No, this is fantastic. Yeah. This is our bedroom. It's a bedroom and office and uh, sort of research area as well. Wow, it's um, beautiful. So, yeah, this is largely where we spend our time. Okay, so I'm being nosy now. Do you have a bathroom back here? We have a bathroom. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not necessarily what you would be used to. Uh, showering and bathing uh, with nature all around you is just truly <laughs> fantastic. Derek and Beverly have been together for 36 years, and most of the time, they're within about three feet of each other. You know, we wanted to go out into Africa, and we fell in love, and we fell in love with that lifestyle and with this place. And that means together, uh, not separately. And um, I think that's, in many ways, what defines us. They told us what keeps them going after all these years is the thrill of making new discoveries. They were among the first to discover and document these large lions, some call super lions, who've learned how to live and hunt in water. It was thought that lions hated water. Yes, exactly. And rightly so. We filmed lions in other areas that after a rainstorm they put their paw in and they hate it. They, you, know, they, you know what cats are like. But not here. But not, not in Duba. And so we, we saw these lions swimming in deep, you know, actually just getting their noses out. Their physique uh, started to change. You could see that they were getting huge pectoral muscles and huge necks. 
these lines were at least 15% larger than any other lines we had been working with. It's not only lions they film. They spent three years following this leopard and captured one of the most extraordinary moments in wildlife filmmaking. This baby baboon's mother had just been killed by the leopard. Instead of killing the baby, the leopard cared for it throughout the night, trying to keep it alive. But another example of a scene that, that uh, we were able to capture that, that nobody had ever seen before, nobody had ever heard about before, and, and is almost unimaginable. Maybe before you documented it, no one would have believed that was possible. I think that very often when we start talking about the things that we filmed, uh, we do get pushback from some scientists saying that's impossible. Um, and thankfully then you, you show the film and it advances science in many ways. Today they feel an urgency to do more than make films. And they've teamed up with the National Geographic Society to create the Big Cats Initiative trying to draw attention to the fact that the number of big cats in the wild is falling fast, particularly lions. In our lifetimes, we've seen those numbers go down from 450,000 to just 20,000. So we are, in fact, filming the last of those lives. I mean, this could be the very last couple of generations of a species that's been on the planet for three and a half million years. For their next film, Derek and Beverly were going back to the story of their lioness, Mardi Tao, trying to find out what happened to her last surviving cub. This is him two years ago, the last time they saw him. When we joined them, they were starting to believe he might be dead. It's physically hard and it's emotionally hard because we, we are getting to um, know an animal and then see some desperate traumatic situation happening to it and that is emotionally draining. It's Derek's job to track and on our second day he spotted lion prints in the sand. Beverly is constantly scanning and searching the bush. This might be our cub. Oh my gosh. Good guy. This is giving me chills. <laughs> no, this is him. This is him all right. They know it's him from his whisker pattern, which is like a fingerprint. He's developing he's quite a mane. Eh? Yeah. He's looking quite good. He's looking handsome as hell. Yes. <laughs> he is handsome. I had actually written him off. I thought that he was gone. Uh, um, and so seeing him is a bit like, you know, reuniting with family. We spent a lot of hours with this guy. As we watched, more lions wandered towards us, and we realized we were exactly where the Jubairs like to be. Are we literally surrounded by lions in every direction at this point? We are, aren't we? Eh? So we we've got, got Muddy Tower and the cubs out there. With another female. We've got the male and female here, the young male over there, and the little female out in that direction. So there's no way out of this one. <laughs> How long can you two keep doing this? I think forever. I think that this is our calling in life, and uh, I can't imagine doing anything different. Uh, giving this up and then what? Living in New York? I wonder God fit in there. <laughs> Go to 60minutesovertime.com to hear our famous filmmakers talk about making a marriage work alone in the African bush.